Okay, so I'm not that great of a military historian, but I do indeed want to tell you something about the war. So I'm going to call this the war theaters and battles. The theater concept is just the general area where the war is being fought and then the battles, the specific activities that are going on. One critical point in association with the war and that I really want you to know is that the British really dominate almost everything in association with the American Revolution. I mean, they were so much more powerful than the Americans that they, they could really do that. So they dominate kind of where the war is being fought. They dominate the battles, really. In fact, the British win the vast majority of the battles as far as the revolution is concerned. So, you know, there's always sort of this kind of way that the British are not exactly in charge, but, you know, dominating the scene one way or the other. But here's the thing. The Americans seem to win the most important battles. You know, very few win victories, but those that they win kind of become critical, or maybe that's a I don't know, tautological thing, but it does. It, it's true. You know, that when they win a battle, it really makes a big it makes a difference essentially. And the Americans also didn't really have to be absolutely victorious. They had just to continue to survive and to continue the fight. And their hope was, and of course, it becomes the essential reality is that there'll come a moment where. The, the British just give up on it, you know, that they're, they're unwilling to continue the extraordinary expense of manpower and money and to continue this. And, then, so, and the Americans do that. One of the greatest skills of George Washington was preserving his army, he made sure that the army was still there. And, and you know, and ultimately the British will finally begin to say, this is, we, this is unwinnable. It becomes this kind of uh, untenable situation. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to tell you about the war. I'm going to focus on the so-called theaters and battles. Sorry about that, theaters and battles. And what, there are three theaters of war, so three areas where the war was focused as we go through time. And the first focal area was in New England. And this is simply, of course, the aftermath of Lexington and Concord. The British retreat back to Boston. They are surrounded by about 25,000 American militiamen who just kind of encompass the entire area around Boston so that the British can't do anything like that again. They can't venture out again in the same kind of way. Well, the British ultimately will believe that this is untenable. They can't allow themselves to be kind of held in and quarantined by the Americans. So they decide to break through this hold up upon them. And in typical kind of British arrogance, they decided not to attack the Americans at their weakest point, but really to attack them at their strongest point. And so this became the famous Battle of Bunker Hill in June of 1775. On a hot June day in 1775, the British decided they were going to take this, this hill. The hill is technically, I think the hill is actually called Breed's Hill. But somehow there's this kind of interesting mix-up where it will become Bunker Hill and because that's just the way it will stick from this time. If you go to Boston, cross over the Charles River, you can walk on the Liberty Trail, you walk up to Bunker Hill, there's a big huge obelisk up there, the Bunker Hill Memorial. Um, but what I think is so interesting is that it doesn't seem like much of a hill to me. I'm in Southern California, like the Pea Mountain is a hill or something like that. But when I got to the top of Bunker Hill, I was seriously thinking, are my feet higher than where my head was at the bottom? You know, I mean, it's, it's the Bunker Slant or something, the Bunker Incline. Anyway, the Americans at the top of this hill had created a little fortification. It was kind of an observation post where they could look down upon the British and see what they were doing. The British thought that this was, you know, this, should, this, this shouldn't be, of course, so it was their decision to, to deal with this. So the Americans entrenched logs you know, down below them, kind of hunkering down there. The British decided to do their classic continental battle style, red jackets, crosses on the chest, of course, you know, guns at the ready, and to march up the hill to take over, to take this hill. And they will, they will march up this hill, you know, and they'll come up, to the, up towards the crest of it. There's a very famous order that came to the Americans from their commanding officer. Didn't want them to waste their shots, so he said, hold your fire, boys, until you can see, you guys know what this one's all about, the whites of their eyes, right? And you don't fire until you can see the whites of their eyes. And the Americans would hold fire until, you know, the British were up close and they let loose upon them. So what the British will do is they will march up that hill seven times and seven times be repulsed. And on the eighth time, they actually do take the hill. So you, the British can claim victory, of course, at Bunker Hill. But the British suffer a thousand casualties, 200 dead, over 800 wounded. The Americans lost 25 men. You know, too many victories like that, of course, and you're going to find yourself in grave difficulty, to say at least. The Battle of Bunker Hill is, could be claimed against like so much, you know, as a British victory. But the reality was, you know, for the Americans, it was a huge morale boost. I mean, they kind of saw that they could challenge the British and, and, and could fight, you know, it would, uh, without too much difficulty. So here's the critical outcome, though, of the Battle of Bunker Hill. 
it may convince the British, first of all, that New England was problematic and they should go someplace else if they're really going to have a base of operation. But it also convinced them that this was going to be a war of belligerence. And so that means, of course, that they were going to commit themselves to the war in a serious way. They're going to send over their, uh, their military, they're going to send over their navy. O over 32,000 British soldiers are going to start coming, you know, pouring into America as the British really commit to this uh, activity. Now, what they will do is they will move their focal points. So you move a new theater of war. And the new location from which they will operate is New York. And the New York theater will be the dominant location of activities from 1776 to 1778. So they're, they're convinced by the problems in Boston that they've got to go someplace else. And so they're going to go to New York. And I've got this new map, and I'm hoping it'll be a little bit better for us, you know, um, a little more colorful and kind of jump out at you a little bit. Um, but so here's the uh, Massachusetts Bay, so the centering in Boston, they're going to move their base of operations down to New York, to, uh, to Manhattan Island. There's a moment there where the British Navy and transports just come into New York Harbor, and it must have been just amazing to wake up to be a citizen of New York, to, holy smoke, you know, I don't know how many ships there were just, you know, dozens and dozens of ships, of course, and as I told you, 32,000 soldiers coming in. Um, Washington was in the area, of course, and they take kind of one look at that. They're like, oh, we better get the hell out of here. And, you know, there's a kind of battling retreat. Uh, there's a battle of Brooklyn Heights where they come. They landed in the Brooklyn area, not on Manhattan Island itself, but, you know, ultimately forcing the Americans out of that area. Um, not much the Americans <coughs> could necessarily do to, to stop them there. But uh, the British will then use New York, essentially, as the, the focal, uh, focal point of their operation. Now, New York, as they enter to New York, there's, there becomes a strategy. They, they have a basic notion of what they're going to do. And I'm going to try to close in the map so I can show this to you guys a little bit better. Okay, hopefully that'll work. So, the British, British notion was that the primary problem was here in New England. Maybe I'll stand on this side, of course. The primary problem was in New England. So they felt that if they could create a front and, and just kind of a line, it's the same basic line of the border of New York right here, this yellow state. They could create kind of a front and they could control that front and then just advance through New England, they could quell the entire situation. So this became the strategic objective just to cut off New England from the rest. And making an assumption, of course, that there's not much of a problem anywhere else in the colonies, although there probably was a problem in the rest of the colonies. But making this front. And the original notion was that there would be an army that would come from Canada to the south. There's two rivers here. One's called the Champlain River. It kind of goes straight south. And then from that will come the Hudson River, which pretty much goes straight. Straight. Okay. The Champlain River actually flows straight north, and the Hudson River flows straight south. So creating the kind of two line, this line right here. So one army would come down from Canada, one army would come up from New York, the two of them would sort of meet, and then they would, you know, coalesce and move across the entire area, bring it, and bringing about it. Okay, so um, this was their primary objective, and, and you know, it's not going to go exactly the way they want it to go, and I'll tell you what's going to happen here. Well, this strategic goal, oops, sorry about that you know, becomes the foundation for what was really, in many ways the most important battle of the American Revolution for the Americans. And this is the Battle of Saratoga. And I'm, of course, going to use the Battle of Saratoga as a potential identification uh, for our second midterm examination. And the Battle of Saratoga will generally happen in October of 1777. Now, the idea was to, as I told you already, to cut off New England from the rest of the colonies, the strategic objective. And so they would use the Hudson River, Champlain River valleys, essentially, as the device to do this. Although they did not mobilize the army from the south, though it was there, I don't exactly know why it didn't move, they did mobilize an army from the north. So coming out of Canada was a large British army under the command of a, an officer that became known to everyone as Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. So Johnny Burgoyne was the commanding officer. He's one of your typical aristocratic generals who probably you know, got his job primarily because of his wealth, not necessarily became a general because of his wealth, not because of his particular abilities. But the reason he was called Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne was because wherever he went, he always wanted to have his creature comforts. So that meant that he had this big pavilion tent with multiple rooms, of course, and, for, and Persian rugs all over the place. He had French chefs who were there to prepare his meals for him. Uh, he had prostitutes. I have no idea what they were for. I, I'm not really clear on that particular. You know, but he had everything he wanted, of course, for his particular comfort. And he pretty much allowed his army, to, his officers and others, to have everything they wanted, too. 
So he's moving this substantial army of, um, of British army um, of 8,000 men, but heavily burdened, you know, all this big, all these camp followers, all these supply wagons, all this kind of stuff, moving ponderously on their way from Canada down towards the south. Now, the Americans, of course, will make it as difficult as they possibly can for them. Uh, the Americans decided they would do everything they could to block the roads, so they chopped down trees all along the roads coming from the, from the north to the south. And, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but I'll never forget waking up one morning with the Santa Ana when I lived in Riverside with my mom and dad. And two big trees had fallen across the block, one at one end of the block and the other at the other end. So we couldn't get out. You know, it's just we had to wait for the city to come and finally get the trees out of the way. But the British Army was spending more time clearing the roads than they were actually marking, marching. So I put this little uh, suggestion down here at the bottom. There's this one period where they, they were able to only go 25 miles in 25 days. That's, that's, a, that's a mile a day. You guys all know from moving an army, that's a really super so place. But this was the Americans doing what they could to you know, sabotage the activity. While the British are slowly moving down from Canada, the Americans were beginning to mobilize a military force to meet them. And the American commanding officer was General Horatio Gates. He's one of the famous sort of, you know, second level of generals under George Washington. He would able to be able to amass something like 15,000 Americans. By this time, the, uh, the, of course, the Americans do have a regular army, but often it would be supplant or su supported by militia. So many of these individuals were militia, but, you know, the guys are by this time becoming pretty tough fighters. And so they were preparing themselves. And what that meant, among other things, was the Americans would significantly uh, over outnumber, of course, the British as they were coming. That was a relatively uncommon phenomenon when, Brit when the Americans and the British would meet each other. So anyway, um, uh, Burgoyne is marching south on these roads, of course, that are increasingly blocked. He approaches this area called Saratoga. So this is about halfway up uh, the state of New York, essentially. The first inclination that the British were approaching the Americans were that there were American sh uh, sharpshooters up in the trees, and they simply targeted the British officers. They're riding on their horses with their brilliant scarlet outfits, and they're gorgeous right there, and these sharpshooters just start to pick them up. It's kind of like, welcome to America, as far as the Americans were concerned. The battle itself is complex. There were three major engagements that will occur. It will occur over a span of weeks, not just days, okay? So I can't tell you too much about that, but I do want you guys to know, in the end, the Americans are absolutely victorious. And indeed, Burgoyne was forced to surrender 7,000 British redcoats. I mean, this was a, a tremendously big victory as far as the Americans were concerned. So the Battle of Saratoga becomes critically kind of important. Uh, the surrendering of, of, of the British Army, this massive victory, will have huge impacts upon the Americans. I think one critical impact was simply the massive morale boost that it gave to the American soldiers. The, the Americans routinely, they, they would lose their battles, okay? So it was, and it was just so hard to be an American soldier. There was very little money for them. There were very little materials for them. You know, they're kind of endlessly hungry, uh, endlessly limited in the number of bullets they would have, of course. You know, endlessly without very good shoes and things. You know, just a kind of continuum of difficulty uh, for these American, American soldiers. But here they had a huge victory that just made them feel better about themselves. And after the Battle of uh, Saratoga, many of the soldiers enlisted for the duration. So they basically said, we can do this, we can win this. And of course, their commitment was critical. In, in, in America, for the militia and others, you know, oftentimes if the battle went poorly, the, the, the men just went home. They would walk home, okay? After the Battle of Saratoga, there seems to be more of a commitment, especially for the regular army, that they're going to, you know, they're going to fight this sucker to the end, okay? But of all the results associated with Saratoga, the most important by far was what's going to happen with the French. So Benjamin Franklin is there in France, and he's basically the only, am the lone ambassador of the United States of America. And he's endlessly badgering the French to come into the, to, the, to the situation, come to the war on the side of the Americans. Now, the French basically just, you know, they poo-poo this. You, know, they look at, you guys are going to get your butts kicked. They, they, had, they couldn't believe that the Americans could stand up to the might of the, of the British, British government, the British military. But when all the sudden news of the Battle of Saratoga comes, that the Americans have defeated a regular British army, kind of mano a mano, then the French began to change their attitude. And, you know, and of course, Franklin was there egging them on every single inch of the way. You know, come on, be part of this. So the French will decide to offer to the Americans a full military alliance. And this is critically important, basically. That means the French are going to give to the Americans uh, monetary support, money. They're going to support them with personnel, or with, excuse me, with materials. They're going to support them with personnel. They're going to send their army over there. They're going to send their navy over there. 
And the critical factor is that all of a sudden the war is going to get so much more difficult for the British than it had been before. I mean, they had just been fighting the Americans. Now they're fighting a major European power, too. And there are battles where it seems like there are more French there than the battle in the American Revolution than there are Americans. So this is a critical, um, critical, a critical moment. And we basically suggest to you, you know, here's the significance of the Battle of Saratoga. This is the turning point of the war. The war is going to be so much harder for the British, of course, and it's going to get so much better as far as the Americans are concerned. Now, one other result of the Battle of Saratoga is that the, um, the British decide that their, the situation in New York is no longer functional. So they decided to reorient themselves, and this time they're going to move down to South Carolina. So South Carolina became the final major theater of the war. And unfortunately, I didn't include the dates here, so 1778 to 1781. South Carolina becomes the center point of the, uh, of the British activity. Now, in moving to South Carolina, and I'll show you on the map right here, so they had first started here, up here in New England, they moved then to New York, and now they're down here in South Carolina, this yellow area, okay? And, you know, I don't know if you what you're looking at, but I see strategic retreating. They're getting farther and farther away from the initial objective. So, in many ways, moving to South Carolina is a symbol of the fact that things are not going well for them. And one thing I always like to suggest you is that you have to in some ways feel for the British soldiers. They were brought over here, of course, they were treated miserably in terms of being a, a British soldier, and all they see is this unending war, and they have no chance to go home and no chance to do anything. I have to tell you, there were over 5,000 British soldiers who deserted during this war because they simply got sick of the situation. And in, interestingly, a num number of them ultimately fought for the Americans, so they switched sides and they fight for the Americans towards the end. Now, again, in South Carolina, the British are able to kind of dominate the scene. Uh, they are going to win significant victories in South Carolina, but they also find themselves sort of thrown into the, this mix of in, the internecine conflict between the Loyalists and the Patriots. South Carolina like, was a place of civil war. The, the two sides were powerful. The two sides were at each other kind of all the time, essentially. This is the realm of the Swamp Fox. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of something like this, but South Carolina was clearly one of the more problematic parts areas as far as the revolution was concerned, the conflict between loyalists and patriots. So, you know, for the British, it's not necessarily a significant improvement in any kind of way. Well, coming out of, of the, this area, South Carolina, uh, finally, sort of, there was a movement by their commanding officer whose name was Lord Cornwallis. And Lord Cornwallis simply decided that, you know, he needed to do something to really push to try to end this war. So Cornwallis decided that he would advance out of South Carolina up into Virginia, so heading back into the North area. And what he does is he gets himself on a, on, a, on a, like a peninsula of land, and it's between two rivers. On the one side is the, should be doing it this way for you guys, on the one side is the uh, James River, so not too far from where Jamestown was, and the other one coming down this way would be Yorktown. And so he gets his army kind of on a peninsula of land, here I'm trying to do it with my hands, and um, I don't know if you guys know, but one of the things they tell you in military is you should never put your army in a place where you can't get out of it, okay? Now, routinely, this would not be a problem because, you know, what they're, he's on an area of land that will go into the Chesapeake Bay. Routinely, that was okay because the British Navy would be there to save your butt. But in this particular moment, the British Navy had been overcome by the French Navy at the Battle of the Virginia Capes. So it's the French Navy, I think it's de Grasse was the admiral of the French Navy that's sort of sitting there. And so the British under Lord Cornwallis, find themselves between the proverbial rock and a hard place. They've got the French army facing them, they've got the American army facing them, they've got the French navy sort of, you know, uh, sitting out there off, off coast just a little bit, and Cornwallis, you know, is in grave difficulty. And he built a fortification there at Yorktown, you know, with an attempt to kind of survive this in kind of a siege situation. And a battle will occur, uh, and this will become, if I kind of didn't bring it in very as way I should have, but the Battle of Yorktown occurring in October of, uh, of 1781, and after you know some days of, of conflict and, and, and battle, uh, the Lord Cornwallis is also, of course, ultimately forced to surrender, surrendering 8,000 soldiers to the Americans. Just this critical kind of uh, defeat, as far as the British are concerned. I'm always intrigued by the dynamics of warfare in those days. So when when you were defeated, you know they had a lot of ceremonial activities. So one ceremonial activity was that the commanding officer would hand his sword over to the victorious officer. Now, there was a ceremony like that, so Cornwallis did take out his sword. They would usually grab it by the blade, of course, handing it handle first to the individual. 
In this case, he refused to hand it to George Washington, only willing to hand it to the French commanding officer as if to say, you know, the Americans, you guys can't beat us, but only the French could do this. And I want you guys to know that George Washington didn't, could give a damn. You know, he, the, the battle was won and, and that, that's all he cared about, basically. And then the final act that became interesting was that they, they lined the French, it was a road, and they lined the French army on one side and the American army on the other side. And then the British army marched between the two armies with their guns upside down. So this was a symbol of defeat. And it's actually a very, it's a practical symbol that you can't fight. Because, you know, the way those guns were, with the, you, you, so you put the ball in, a muzzle-loading gun, and you'd have your ball kind of crammed down in there. And you're hoping it's going to stay there, right? But you can imagine if you like charging and you let your barrel dip, there's a chance that your ball could simply roll right out. And wouldn't that be sad if you watch your, the ball roll out? You go, most you could do is discharge the weapon and hope that the, you know, the bang that would scare someone or something like that. But they marched with their guns held upside down. And as they did it, uh, Cornwallis ordered the band to play this British song called The World Turned Upside Down. The World Turned Upside Down. As if to say, you know, everything is topsy-turvy now. The Americans have somehow defeated us. If you guys ever get a chance, you know, and I hope you can see Hamilton. It's coming out in a Disney movie. I think Disney's going to do something where they're going to kind of make the movie of the actual play. It's ridiculous, of course, how expensive it is to go to these plays. One time I did it. It was my birthday present. And for the four of us, my, my wife and my two daughters, almost $2,000 just to go see that damn play. And I got to tell you, they all, oh, that's all I got for my birthday and for Christmas. What can I say? Anyway, and, and I liked it. You know, I was happy about that. But uh, Lynn manuel of course, will take this, and he turns this into, The world turned upside down. It's a really cool song, as they're suggesting what happening in the aftermath of Yorktown. Well, here is the critical outcome of what's happening after Yorktown. The British finally, and this is now, what, six years into the, the conflict, the British Parliament votes to disengage. They basically decide, no, it's done. And it'll take some time, of course, all the wrecking negotiation, but the Battle of Yorktown will signal the beginning of the end of the British interactions in the American Revolution and a movement ultimately, of course, to the peace. And so here's my final little, um, presentation to you guys on this, on the Warren Revolution. I want to tell you about the peace, and the peace will be manifest through something called the Treaty of Paris of 1783. And the Treaty of Paris of 1783 is a potential identification for you guys, okay? I do want you to know that you always have to be careful with treaties that are, take place in Paris because there are so many of them. I think there's a Treaty of Paris that ends the, the Seven Years' War, the Peace of Paris ends World War I. I guess Paris is just a really good place to make peace or something like that. But this is the Treaty of Paris, 1783. Now, what that means, of course, is that they're going to end the war by having a negotiation that will take place in Paris. And it's a little bit strange that one of the belligerent countries, France, is going to host this. Usually, you know, you'd think you'd go to a neutral location or something like that. So that meant that the French are there, of course, the Americans are coming, and the British are going to come in. Representing the Americans, uh, and others were involved in it too, but primarily Benjamin Franklin and John Adams as the uh, am ambassadors for the United States of America uh, to be involved in the negotiations. So they're there, of course, and they're going to try to deal with the, the British. Now, the British arrive at this situation very unhappy, as you can imagine. So many things. They're losing the war, of course, and really very unhappy with the whole French situation, especially the, they felt the French, by, by hosting the treaty, are trying to manipulate the situation. So the British decided that they're going to they're going to going to mess with this just a little bit, okay? So they take the Americans aside. They they say let's let's get away from these French people, right? They take the Americans aside and they offer to the Americans a very very generous treat, uh, peace treaty. So this is one of the interesting components of the peace uh, the Treaty of Paris that the British will arrive and be so generous as far as the Americans are concerned. So what I want to do is tell you exactly what they offered the Americans. And we call these provisions. So the treaty provides for this. The treaty provides for that. So here are the provisions of the Treaty of Paris. The first thing that the British offered to the Americans was unconditional independence. So that meant that the British would recognize that the United States of America was an independent entity. And by the way, you're not really a country until someone recognizes you. And as, um, as the British recognized, the I mean, that's guaranteeing that there's going to be the United States of America. But this is kind of like a divorce with no conditions, okay? Okay, we recognize you guys are independent, and uh, you can just go and do what you need to do. So, number one, they simply said, okay, here, you're your own country, we get it. The second thing that they offered, and I never quite understood this one, but I think it's interesting, is they offered the Americans fishing rights to the Grand Banks. The Grand Banks was a very rich fishing area off of Nova Scotia. It's about 500 miles to the east of Massachusetts, so quite a way out there. 
And, you know, I'm not exactly sure why they did it, but I think the Americans said, great, you know, that's a good place for us to go fish the codfish. So the Americans got to fish the Grand Banks. Probably the greatest gift of the British in this particular moment was that they ceded to the Americans all lands east of the Mississippi River. Now, the Americans did not live in this, in this very large area. And I'm going to hold this up for just a second before I go to the map. So, you know... Where the colonists lived was just here on the coast. They just lived probably about like two, 200 miles inland. And what the British were offering was all the, here's the Mississippi River right here, okay? So all the lands uh, east of the Mississippi River, south of Canada, of course, that was the British controlled area. At that time, Florida was controlled by uh, Spain. So Spain kind of controlled the entire lower end tier right here on the Gulf of Mexico. But everything else, of course, was offered to the Americans. And I gotta tell you, it's a huge gift. I've often wondered, you know, the British didn't have to give this away. But maybe their own notion was that if they didn't give it to them, you know, then there would be in the future conflicts that could be part of it. But I think the real thing was that the British wanted to guarantee that the Americans were strong enough that no one could mess with them. And that's pretty much the way this is going to work itself out. So a huge gift of land, and I'll tell you much more, you know, almost immediately the Americans are just like freaking out, thinking about, oh my God, all that land, let's go out there, let's settle that. And it begins to push them west in a fairly significant way. The fourth and final part of provision of the treaty, and this is much more complicated than I can present it to you, is that the British basically said that they would ignore British property claims in America. The British owned a lot of property in America. That could be plantations and farms, just land areas. That could be businesses and houses. The British owned a lot of stuff in America. Remember that this was part of the British Empire. And the British basically said, okay, we'll ignore all of that, which essentially meant that they would turn over those properties to the Americans. This is like a divorce where one side gets all, and you guys all know that that's just, you know, that's not going to happen very often, okay? So the British are extremely generous to the Americans, and it actually becomes kind of a historical question, you know, what exactly, why exactly would they do this? You know, I want to go back to my British, generous, you know, why were the British so generous? This becomes an essential question. And of course, if I was with you in the class, I'd want you to guess why they were so generous. And, you know, I don't know if you would guess this, but, you know, part of it was economic. They wanted to keep the trading relation. The Americans were very important in terms of their overseas trade. I think it, I think it told you colonial America represented 40% of British overseas trade. That's not something they want to lose. I mean, that's something that's a great benefit to them. So, you know, in large part, it may very well be that they wanted to keep uh, the trading relations that, that became part of it. But to be honest with you, there was something even more important than that as far as the British were concerned. And the irony of the situation is it has nothing to do with the Americans at all. They were simply so pissed off at the French. I mean, they just were angry with the French. And they wanted to guarantee that whatever happened at the end of this situation, the French would not benefit. So the entire goal, the only reason, British are pissed off at the Americans. They don't, they don't want to give them anything. But it was more important to them that they would screw over the French. That the, the French had interfered in their internal situation and caused them great grief as associated with that. So they wanted to guarantee that the French were, are going to really suffer this outcome. And I, I got to tell you, this is like punking the French, and they did it so amazingly well. The French begin are going to bankruptcy relatively quickly because of all the money they had spent. The bankers, bankruptcy leads to a constitutional crisis. The king calls for the States General, and that leads ultimately into the French Revolution, where it becomes increasingly violent. The king gets his head off, chopped off, and the queen gets her head, and then everybody else gets their head chopped off. And they kill. I mean, I almost feel like the British are sitting back looking at that, going, "Oh my God, did we punk them?" You know. But the entire reason for the generosity is not because they love the Americans, they're, they're pissed off at the Americans. It's just that they really wanted to make sure that the French, will, there'll be no benefit to them whatsoever. But in many ways, of course, you know, and it's sad for the French the way it's going to work out, uh, this treaty will become this extraordinary boon to the emerging United States of America, and giving them a foundation, of course, which will allow them to grow and develop themselves. And so, you know, the outcome of the, of the American Revolution ultimately is very, very benign as far as the Americans are concerned. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and stop right there, and I'll pick it up a little bit later.